Greetings to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and welcome to you as we join together in online worship from First United Methodist Church, Buchanan, West Virginia. The Children's Sunday School YouTube link has been sent by Facebook and email. Today's live stream will be uploaded to YouTube, and we will share that link by email and Facebook as soon as we have that link. Also, you may listen to the Sunday worship on Sermon by Phone. Call 1-304-250-4556. It's not a live uh, sermon, uh, but it will be available after Sunday's worship has been uploaded. And you can catch the Sunday sermon by visiting the church website or on the church app. The Restart team will meet on Monday, October the 26th, uh, to consider the possibility of returning to in-person worship. Right now, the team and the church leadership feel that the church family is safest at home with the recent increase in virus infections. Please pray for the team and the church family, and especially those who are affected by the COVID-19 virus. And thank you to all who are continuing your support. As we remain worshiping online, First Church still needs your gifts to make sure that ministry continues. You may either mail your gifts of tithes and offerings to the church office, or you can visit the church website and use the PayPal method of electronically giving. Go to www.firstchurchum.com and on the homepage, look for the donate button, or you may drop your offering by the parsonage in the mailbox. Again, thank you as we gather together as a digital community of faith drawing close to God and close to one another through a shared worship experience. Let today's worship begin.
emptiness of much we call life, the Spirit moves among us, calling us into new being. We come together to seek light amid the shadows, fulfillment out of the hollowness and despair. From separation and isolation, God in Christ calls us to steadfast love and reconciliation. In these moments of worship, May we find healing and peace, experience forgiveness, acceptance, and a renewed purpose. In the midst of the ordinary and extraordinary, God comes to us. In the everyday, God still visits and redeems us. Remind us of your presence, O God and our friend. Come to your people and lift their troubled hearts. Take our burdens Free us and fill us with your spirit. Our hymn of praise is Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above. Let us pray. You who have created us and who sustains us, we come together with thanksgiving for these moments when we can ease the pace of our lives and listen for your voice. Create a spirit within and among us that truly draws us toward you and toward our sisters and brothers. A spirit deep, gentle, and brave. Clear our minds, 
open our hearts and touch us with your presence and your power. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our friend and our Savior. Amen. Our choral call to prayer is Lead Me, Lord. God, our provider, out of your fullness, you cause life to spring up in barren landscapes. You have power to control troubled waters. You hear our cries and receive our tears. You restore us to the joy of your salvation. You have done great things for us, O oh God, continually working all day for our good. We thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whose life and ministry guides us in every season of life. In his suffering and death, he knows full well the troubles and pains we face in this earthly life. In his resurrection is the hope of our own. Surrounded by your overflowing love, we are not alone. With thanksgiving, we celebrate your care and the gifts of new life and renewal for recovery from illness or injury, for calm after a time of unrest or turmoil, for a sense of direction after uncertainty, for strength for today and hope for tomorrow, for new opportunities. We pray for people who wait in difficult places, for those who are suffering and those at life's end, for people struggling with employment and financial worries, for those estranged from loved ones, for those trapped in the grip of addiction, for people enduring emotional or spiritual turmoil, because you were able to make a way in every wilderness we thank you, O oh God. We pray for the needs of the world. May peace invade places of war and may justice crowd out oppression and cruelty. Protect soldiers and citizens alike from harm's way and bring an end to all conflict. Bless leaders of communities, states, and nations that they may speak the truth and work with others for the common good. Comfort those devastated by the pandemic and natural disasters. Strengthen those supplying care, shelter, food, and aid. Amid the chaos of this world, your spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. We are grateful for the spirits praying for us when we are unable to pray for ourselves or others. We pray for the church, the body of Christ in the world, that we may boldly proclaim your word. Lead us by the power of your spirit to witness to your truth, for we remember and proclaim that death does not have the last word in our lives, in the church, or in the world. We thank you, O oh God. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen.
and with confidence of the children of God, let us pray together the prayer the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And our response to the prayer is, we're across the crowded ways of life. It's time for wiggle time. Good morning, campers. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're enjoying this second Sunday in October. October is one of my favorite months of the year. I love it when the summer heat seems to pass by and, and there's cooler temperatures, but I think probably what I, what I really enjoy the most is the beautiful colors of fall and watching the leaves change and and the trees are so beautiful in the springtime when they bud out, and they're so beautiful in the summertime when they're in full green and, and all their glory. But in the fall, when the leaves begin to change, there's all these different colors, and it reminds me of all the different people and how God loves all of us, regardless of what we look like or who we are. It's just a beautiful time of the year. When I was your age, I can remember going to my grandpa's fishing camp on the Greenbrier River. And sometimes on Sunday afternoons, like today, where it's forecast to rain, I would just go by myself and sit on grandpa's back porch. It was a screened-in porch, and he had a, had a thing called a glider. It's about the size of a small couch, but it, it's kind of like a rocking chair, except it just kind of moves back and forth, and for a little boy, uh, eight or nine or ten years old, to be by himself on Grandpa's back porch, well, it was a wonderful time to be there, especially if it was in October and the leaves around Greenbrier River were changing, and even if there was a little bit of rain, it was just a wonderful place to be. You know I have a dog named Bishop, and, and Bishop... He's a little older than 10 years old now, and that's, that's pretty good for a, 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 that's about 70 years old uh, for a beagle. Uh, but anyway, uh, Bishop has developed in, in the past year or two uh, a fear, a fear of 
the pops that fireworks makes, and also the booms of thunder. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of enjoy a, a good thunderstorm sometimes. It's just as long as it doesn't cause anybody any trouble and there's no lightning strikes. But, but if Bishop begins to hear it rain and hear the rain hit the windows, it frightens him. And because it, the reason the rain frightens him is because he knows that somewhere in that rain there may be thunder, and it frightens him. And so he starts to pace back and forth through the house, and I'll call, over to, call him over to me, have him sit at my feet, and I'll rub his shoulder and his side and his head, and I can feel the little guy tremble. I know he's frightened, and I try to tell him, it's okay, Bishop, it's all right. It's, 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 it's going to be fine. You're here with Dad. Everything's okay. Well, it takes a while, and he settles down, but usually he settles down best when, when the storm's over and when the rain stops and when there's no thunder. There are times when we get frightened too, and sometimes in our fear, Jesus comes to us in a special way. And he touches our hearts and he touches our minds and our spirits, and he says, it's going to be okay. I'm here with you. We're going to be all right. And the wonderful thing about that is Jesus has never let me down. I don't think Jesus will ever let you down either. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for coming to us when we're frightened. We thank you for the glory of your creation. And even we're thankful, O oh Lord, for the storms that come. Most of all, we're thankful, O oh Lord, that you surround us with your presence when we're fearful. Keep us safe. Pour your blessings, O oh God, upon all my kids, upon the church family. And help us to know, O oh Lord, that you are always with us. Amen.
return and not my own. Put me where you will and let me serve in everything I do. Let me This is my prayer, Lord, to you, my promise and my vow, strong and true, and the covenant I make on earth, let it be fulfilled in heaven. Thank you, Renee. The gospel lesson for today comes to us from the gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter, verses 17 through 27. As Jesus was sitting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to said them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals... It is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. The word of God for God's people this day. Thanks be to God. Have you ever tried to get your day going only to be interrupted over and over again? There's a phone call or three. Someone is ringing the doorbell. There's a text message or an email ch that chimes in on your phone, and you finally get to the shower only to realize that you forgot to get a clean towel from the dryer. One interruption after the other can make a stressed day. I think that very thing may have happened to Jesus in today's gospel lesson from Mark 10. He had a confrontation with the Pharisees about the law. And people were bringing their children to him to bless them. And no, Jesus is not going to overlook the children. So he picked them up in his arms and blessed them. And just when he began to get on with his day, he stopped by a man that had a question that just had to be answered by Jesus. I wonder if Jesus was tempted to push past the man or tell him that he's a terrible man and he asks terrible questions or act like the priest or Levite in the Good Samaritan story and cross the street to the other side just to avoid him altogether. 
Or maybe someone told the man that he should listen more carefully when Jesus was teaching. After all, there were other villages and other people waiting for Jesus. But Jesus, in his usual caring way, stopped and spoke with the man and addressed the man's burning question. Unlike our world, which is so often cut up, caught caught up in big numbers and metrics, Jesus regards each person as a precious creation of God. Maybe the man had seen Jesus interact with people or, or heard him speak, felt the Spirit, and had actually listened to what Jesus was saying. Why else would he have bothered to approach Jesus? It's likely that he'd been in a crowd that had listened to this new rabbi and was amazed at the authority with which he taught or the fresh approach that Jesus was offering on life and faith. But now this man wanted Jesus to get to the bottom line. It sounds like he wanted to get to the heart of the gospel. So he asks, good teacher, what do I have to do to inherit, inherit eternal life? Is there something more that I have to do? I'm a good person. I know the rules, the commandments, and I've faithfully kept them. I try to be a good neighbor. I try to do the thoughtful thing. This question could have been asked with the best of intentions because he felt that something was missing. Maybe he was looking either for a pat on the back for being a good person. Maybe he was looking for a shortcut to heaven. Maybe all the man wanted was some blessed assurance, a word of praise for being a good, decent, God-fearing person, to hear that in keeping the commandments, all he had to do was to keep up the good work that God was really proud of him. Anyway, he asks, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? But don't run up to Jesus and interrupt his day if you don't expect to be challenged. I think the same word of advice reaches to each of us. Don't go to God in prayer without expecting a challenge or a push to grow, or even a change in our faith journey. And the risk for the rich man in Mark is, well, sticker shock for the soul. What we understand as a good enough life is only the beginning of something greater, something much greater you see, Jesus loves us just as we are, but Jesus will not leave us where we are. The point isn't that the man had done nothing wrong. In fact, Mark tells us that Jesus loved the man. He was faithfully keeping the law. He was what we would call a good and decent man, an honorable follower of the faith. Perhaps what Jesus saw was the potential for this man to join the ranks of the disciples to take another step on the faith journey. Well, first, Jesus turned the flattery that the man had used to get Jesus' attention back on the man. The man addressed Jesus as good teacher. Jesus replied, no one is good but God alone. Jesus wanted the man to see that goodness is not something to obtain or possess or even to take pride in, but goodness is a purpose to see. He was trying to get the man to begin to understand that just being good enough is an impossibility. It would appear that Jesus didn't want him to repeat again the mistake of thinking he was good enough. Perhaps Jesus saw the man's pride 
as a feeling of being invincible, that he could be in control of his life and not entrust his life to God and God's direction. See, the mistake is asking what he could do instead of asking God what God could do and would do in and through him. When Jesus got to the bottom line, with love and compassion, he told the man that he was only one step away. But the man couldn't take the step. This man had taken himself too seriously. And now it was time for him to take God seriously. But he couldn't trust God enough to give of what he had been blessed with to those not so blessed and follow Jesus. An American tourist in Jerusalem met a monk who offered to show the tourist around the monastery. And on their tour, they came to the monk's room, his cell, Tourists noticed no TV, no radio, only one change of clothes, a towel, and a blanket. And the tourist asked the monk, how do you live so simply? And the monk answered, I noticed you have only enough things to fill a suitcase. Why do you live so simply? To which the monk's visitor responded, but I'm only a visitor. I'm only traveling through as a tourist. And the monk responded, so am I. So am I. And so the question becomes, those things we think we must have, the things we think we can't live without, do we possess them? Or do they possess us? Harold Kushner notes, in when all you've ever wanted is not enough, he writes these words, our souls are not hungry for fame, comfort, wealth, or power. Those rewards create almost as many problems as they solve. Our souls are hungry for meaning, for the sense that we have figured out how to live so that our lives matter, so that the world will be at least a little bit different for our having passed through. The challenge to the man was not to cause distress in his life, but to change the focus of his life. It was not to create another thing to check off as being done, but to free him from the dependency of things he could possess, to grow in his trust to God and follow Jesus. Our possessions, our wealth, our things, our titles, our prestige, our stuff can be obstacles between us and God and following Jesus. Whenever we get the opportunity to travel or take a vacation, I always remember what Jim Mullins in Travel Tips said. If you want to get away from it all, don't take it all with you. It is difficult to let go of what we depend upon, to let go of what we think we need, to trust God's grace and God's way and follow Jesus. The more we're wrapped up in ourselves, the further we move from God and what God wants for us of being a disciple and following Jesus. Maybe we shouldn't take ourselves so seriously, but take God more seriously. Do you remember the story in Genesis, the story of the beginning of creation and the first humans, of Adam and Eve and the serpent? The serpent tantalizes Eve to eat the one fruit that God forbid them to eat, 
promising that if she ate the fruit, she would be as wise as God. And of course, she sold Adam on the same idea, I guess, since the very beginning. We've been looking for a shortcut, the easy way, or what the minimum standard is for good enough. It didn't work in the Garden of Eden. And it didn't work for the man who approached Jesus. And neither will it work for us. There's no way around it. God doesn't want to be an afterthought in your life. God wants you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind. God may challenge us at one point where at the one point where we are most vulnerable, where we are least likely to take God seriously. The man who had approached Jesus couldn't let go of what he possessed in order to be possessed by God. He might have pleaded, why so much, Lord? Why not allow us to simply say a kind word instead of acting in compassion to help another? Why not allow each of us simply to put a campaign banner in our front lawn saying that we are for God instead of actually being involved for God? Why can't God build thy kingdom come on good intentions? Can't the hungry feed themselves Can't the lonely care for themselves? Can't the children and youth learn their faith from someone else? Can't those burdened by life lift themselves up? We ask, why do I have to be involved? If I'm already doing my part, why do I have to do the part of someone else? The man who had felt so much urgency and asking Jesus for the insight he thought would be simple. Well, that man probably walked away heartbroken with his head dropped in grief. He had come so close, but he had missed the opportunity. Imagine him looking over his shoulder as Jesus and his followers walked away thinking, I wanted so much to be with him, but I don't dare take the risk of giving up all I have to follow Jesus. He may have thought of how Peter, Andrew, James, and John had all dropped their nets and followed Jesus, or how Matthew had gotten up from his tax table to go, but the man just couldn't take that next step of commitment. Don't let the fear of commitment keep you from discovering the joy and peace that comes into your life by receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Have you ever noticed that Have you ever noticed the more you possess, the greater the danger of being selfish, the greater the risk of not letting God be in charge? When Jesus saw what was happening with the man who had been so eager and now was turning away, he warned the disciples. He warned them that it is difficult for a rich person with great possessions to enter the kingdom of heaven. take warning that your possessions don't possess you. He spoke of it being easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom. Well, we don't know what happened to the man who turned away from Jesus. We don't even know his name. If he had accepted the challenge Jesus gave him, he might have been there at Pentecost to stand with Peter. He might have written a gospel like Mark or Luke. He might have been an evangelist like Andrew or a missionary like Paul. But he faded away in history because he was too worried for his life and felt it impossible to make the most important decision of his life to follow Jesus. 
I really hope someone got through to him and helped him to stop worrying about his life and possessions, that someone helped him to realize that God loves him, that God knows his needs, and that he should first seek the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, and then everything will fall into place. Did you hear that? Do you hear the promise that Jesus makes to you and me? For mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Whatever holds us back from making our commitment to God and to following Jesus, let us begin by loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are listening because Jesus has the attention of our souls. Let us drop what holds us back from accepting your gift of saving grace and life. And let us find the courage to follow you. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. Thank you for stopping by for Sunday morning worship, and thank you to the online worship team for their faithful work. Let us pray. Whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, and worthy of praise, oh God, help us to think about these things. May we be strengthened to do what is pleasing and acceptable in God's sight. And may that peace which passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.